good morning. I'm glad all of you made it safely. I do want to piggyback off of something that Kevin was mentioning in the announcements and just take an opportunity to pray. Um, if you are a student, a mentor, a coach, or a parent involved in youth ministry somehow, laterally or directly, would you just raise your hand for me real quick? All right, great. Let's take an opportunity, church, and let's just pray specifically for our youth this week as, as Ice Camp is, is a lot of fun. It's a great opportunity for the teens. Uh, it's a great opportunity for the coaches. It's a, what I, in my time of going there, it's been just an absolute blast. But one of the most important things that we have to recognize about camp is it's designed specifically around giving multiple presentations of the gospel to our kids. And so we pray not only for the encouragement and the strengthening of the kids' faith, but we also pray for those who, who have not yet um, been convicted of the need to repent and to turn to the Lord in salvation. So let's pray for that specifically, but let's also pray for the counselors and the parents and the coaches as well. If you join me, please. Father, we turn to you this week uh, as we prepare to send um, a large group of our youth and, the, and, and all the volunteers associated with them to uh, a special place in the hearts of many people here. It's a, it's a camp where the entire focus is to present the gospel, present your word and your message to our young people. So as, as they go about that this week, Lord, we would pray first um, that you would move powerfully through your word, that you would, um, that you would be a, a convicting force in their hearts. Um, if they have not yet turned to you, that they would turn to you. If they have, that they would just be strengthened in their understanding and in their faith. We also pray for their safety in traveling. Uh, we pray for uh, good road conditions and and uh, able to uh, return safely as well. We pray for the camp counselors who um, give so much of their time and effort into putting together uh, just a phenomenal program there at Miracle Camp. And we're grateful that we have a place like that um, to take our students as an opportunity to uh, get away for a weekend and really uh, try to connect with one another, but also to be influenced by uh, older people who have been walking a bit longer in faith and that they might have an opportunity to share that faith with our kids. And I pray that it be just a wonderful time and upbuilding and encouraging and an edifying opportunity. We lift these things to you, God. This is your church in your son's name. Amen. Hey, and speaking of youth, if you are passionate about youth and you love to see especially our own children come to a knowledge of faith, I want to encourage you with an opportunity. For several weeks now, we have been promoting the Kaisho USA program. We have the booth set up out in the lobby. You can stop by and talk to Jeff uh, before and after service. Here's the deal. Our children have been so blessed and so fortunate to be brought up in an environment where they can attend church with their parents, they can hear the gospel preached regularly, and they can see the word of God active in your lives and in the lives of people around them. There is a place in the world, in the region of Spain, it's called Basque Country, if you're unfamiliar, and there are students there who do not have that opportunity. It is an unreached people group. It is, it is a modernized society. So from the cultural outlook, the perspective of what we might see, they have uh, in many ways similar conditions that we do. They're not, they're not living in the middle of a jungle, and yet they don't know the true gospel. They're unreached. And we have an opportunity this summer to bring students into our world to do the reverse mission trip, to bring them here with us, to live, to live with us for a few weeks, to get a chance to share the gospel with them, to love on them, to care for them, to show them what this looks like. And so if you have the gift of hospitality or if you are interested in developing the gift of hospitality, which at this point should cover pretty much everybody, I want to strongly encourage you to stop and please ask Jeff what you can do to support that ministry this summer. Maybe that's hosting. Maybe that's specifically meeting needs for the ministry this year, or maybe that's even uh, praying between now and that time for the salvation of the lost, for the encouragement of the people who are going to be hosting, and for the building up of the body of Christ through this ministry. So please stop and, and just check that out. Do, do, do me that favor this morning if you can. Let's form a line and let's just ask, how can I be praying for this ministry and, and maybe how can I get involved? If you would do that, I would, I would absolutely be be just stricken with inexplicable words that I'm currently finding at a loss. <laughs> when we rewind the tape and look, listen to that, it's going to be like, he really was at a loss for words. 
which for me is not often the case. So um, with that being said, I will uh, invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Esther. We began the introduction of this book last week. We covered chapter one. I didn't have time to make it all the way through both the first two chapters, which are really combined together the introductory chapters of the book. Both chapters introduce who we're dealing with, the characters involved in the plot of the story. They set us up for what's coming in the middle of the book, the meat of the book, where we hit the dramatic sequence sequences of, of tragedy and, and comic relief and, and failure and, and all these things that combined we can look at and see the providence of, of God working through people, even though, as we mentioned last week, God is not mentioned anywhere in the book. And that's often confusing for us. There's no mention of worship. There's no mention of, of going to offer sacrifices. God's not even prayed to specifically. And so it's a difficult book for us to apply sometimes. Um, and uh, fortunately, what we can do is we can look through the, the, the history and the context of what's happening and see just how visibly apparent God's fingerprints are on every event that happens. It takes us taking it a little bit at a time and then looking at hindsight and saying like, oh, I see, that's where God was moving. That's where God was acting. That's where his providence is showing through. God clearly had a plan. These things aren't just coincidences. God doesn't allow things to just happen by chance. When we say that he's sovereign, we mean that he rules over all things. He can control and manipulate and do whatever he wants because he is the sovereign ruler. When we say that he has providence or his ability to carry that out, that's his enacting his sovereignty. He is in charge and because he's in charge, he can create and craft a plan and move and shape events in such a way that it will carry out what he has designed it to happen. What he has designed to happen. Now that's a great comfort to us for a bunch of reasons. Not the least of which is the fact that he, from the beginning of time, created a plan of redemption that would lead to, ultimately, his son coming, living, being crucified, being ultimately killed, buried, and then resurrected. And this is the basics of the gospel. This is the basics of what we believe is our Christian faith, is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came as a man and lived a perfectly sinless life, completely holy, he gave his life intentionally, pre-planned, knowing that the people there would crucify him and kill him. And that was intentional. That was a providential plan of God that that would happen in order to pay for the sins of those who would believe. And we take hold of that gospel message and we are rescued therein by putting our faith in that message. When we say, this is my Lord, he gave his life that I could be forgiven of sin, that I could be made right with God, that I could have peace with God, and that I could have everlasting life. That, all of that, is the redemptive plan of God that, that was put in place all the way back in Genesis 3.15 when he said, there will be a day where my son will come and he will crush the head of the serpent. This is the gospel. And we can see the fingerprints of that gospel message throughout Esther. And so last week, we encouraged you not only to be looking at Esther just as a historical narrative, which it really is. It's a story. It's a great story. There's a bunch of dramatic things that happen. I, I compared it to kind of a Shakespearean play last week because it moves fast at different points. It moves really slow. There's, there's comical things in here. There's tragic things. But ultimately, the story is pointing us towards Christ. We saw in 2 Timothy 3.15 that all scripture is, is meant to make us wise for salvation. But not just wise for salvation in anything, wise for salvation specifically in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. And we can find that wisdom even within the texts of scripture in the Old Testament. This is why we want to study this. We want to know all of God's word. We want to see how he works even in the moments where maybe the human perspective can't see how he's acting. This is so similar to our lives. Because oftentimes when we have done things, we look for how is God going to work in this? We don't exactly understand or know. But when we've placed our faith in Christ, we trust that God is always at work. And this was the, the beginning of our message last week. And we went on to talk about the world's empire, specifically King Ahasuerus. He's the, the king of the empire of Persia, which is a massive, massive empire, the biggest global empire to that point in history. And, and it would continue to be the largest global empire even after that period of time for a long, long time. An incredibly massive and powerful thing. But we also saw within that that his power was uh, very prideful. 
He was, he was filled with pride and arrogance even. And, and this led to his temper just being off the handle. Uh, for instance, I told the story about he, him just wiping out a whole uh, division of engineers who failed to build bridges appropriately, and he just killed them all and then had his soldiers fight against these seas for, for destroying the bridges and in a complete act of ignorance, but also foolish pride. And we then see him uh, get frustrated and angry with his queen at that point, Vashti, who refused to come before him and his party guests. We're not given the explicit reason, although it should be at least a little bit apparent that this king was objectifying his queen in some way. She refused, and he flies off the handle again in a, in a temper tantrum, allows the people around him to give him bad counsel, and then he banishes the queen. No longer is she a queen. He creates these decrees meant to demand the respect that wives would give to their husbands. This, is, this guy is just prideful, he's arrogant, but he's extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. And we need to be careful because we might assume that just because he's prideful, arrogant, and even making poor decisions that this means he's not dangerous, but he is incredibly dangerous. This is the most powerful man on the face of the planet at his time. He may be an imbecile at moments. He may have a temper tantrum, but he's very powerful. He is the king of the empire. And so living in this empire is incredibly difficult, living under his rule. And we find ourselves coming into chapter two. We're gonna be, we're gonna be introduced to a couple people who are trying to survive in the midst of this guy's reign, in the midst of what this guy is doing and how he's leading. And, and even the, the entirety of the royal classes we'll see throughout the book. So in, in the first chapter, we were given a kind of picture of the power and pride of the, the empire of the world. And here in part two of this introductory message, if you will, we are given a picture of the weakness and survival of Esther and Mordecai. Weakness and survival, really, in the world empire. So we're going to read chapter 2 of Esther. If you're there, I hope you have been able to find it. We'll read chapter 2. After these things, when the anger of King Hesuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them. And let the, young woman, let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And this pleased the king, and, and he did so. Now, there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is, Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at, and when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her in as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther was also taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace. And he advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther did not make known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now, when the turn came for each young woman to go into the king, after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was a regular period of beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women, when the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return to the second harem in custody of Sheshgaz, the king's eunuch, who in charge of the concubines. 
she would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus in his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tibet, in the, 70, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women. And she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people, as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Bigthan and Teresh, two of, kings, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of Chronicles in the presence of the king. A brief word of prayer. Almighty God, the fountain of wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. We ask you to have compassion upon our weaknesses and those things for which our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Grant to give us for the worthiness of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we read through the second chapter of Esther, I want you to take note of the pictures of weakness that are given. How is Esther described or shown in some kind of way to have weakness and maybe even in comparison to the powerful king, Hasuerus, also called Xerxes in case some of you missed that last week. Feelings of helpfulness are awful. A couple weeks ago, uh, after I had injured myself, I went from being, or feeling at least, like I was a strong, capable guy in the house to almost incapable of getting out of a chair on my own. And I felt absolutely helpless. There's sometimes, though, where our helplessness doesn't come from just our own physical limitations. There are times where we feel helpless because of the circumstances that others have placed over us. I think this is what we see with Esther. The weakness is shown because of her circumstances. And on the one hand, she's an orphan, but even underneath the ruling power of this king. I think we can relate to this, though. Because how often have you felt helpless in situations in life where someone else has pressed upon you something for which you can't help? If you've lost a job suddenly and you've, you've had to take that pink slip home, you've had to look at your wife and your kids or your husband and your kids and say, well, I lost my job. I got laid off and now I feel helpless. We know that many people have that experience because just statistically in our country, the richest place on earth a large majority of people are living paycheck to paycheck. And so the sudden loss of a job, either by maybe injury or by being let go or by downsizing or by any of these other factors that, that so often happen, economic downturn, which I know is, is a threat that seems to be looming, we can feel absolutely helpless. What about even in our great republic, as we elect officers to our highest positions in the land, in our Congresses, in our Senate, and in our president, and yet we still have feelings of, of absolute helplessness. 
And I know this is the case because many of you have described it to me in terms of you, you hear something on the news or you hear something happening in our nation and you, you say things like, how on earth could we let it get this far down this road? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to fight back against what seems like an, an impossible system that's designed to work against us? What do we do if, if all of these elected people and all of these officials, what do we do if they disagree and then just absolutely nothing happens? We can't, we can't go any direction and it feels like we're helpless and we're stuck. And sometimes this, this can get the better of us and we can be reminded of that. And, and I want to very early on give you a, a picture of encouragement because we must recognize that we don't place our hope in these things. Our hope isn't in the elected officials, although we do hope that they do well, and we pray for them, or we should be praying for them regularly. And our hope isn't placed in, in our job and its ability to provide for us, although we hope that God strengthens us to be able to do well. We hope that the people who hire us are able to do well. We pray for the people that we work for. We do things to glorify the Lord, not just to get the next promotion or make a bigger paycheck. But these feelings of helplessness are all around us. We can, be, we can be dragged down by them. We can be made to feel less than. I have a feeling that in this chapter, we're getting a picture of <coughs> Esther who, for lack of a better way of saying it, probably didn't feel like a powerful person in the world. In fact, I would, I would suggest Esther probably didn't feel like she had any sort of power whatsoever. She's orphaned, although she has an adopted father who's taken her in graciously, who's cared for her. But the way that this chapter plays out, we not only see that she's born into a situation where she's a Jewish person living in a distant land far away from Israel, all the way out in Persia. She was probably, uh, at some point in her life, dealing with the tension of being a Jew in a, in a, in a Gentile space. We see hints of that, which we'll look at a little bit more deeply. And then we see her trying to survive what the king has decided to do in his kingdom. Now, just to set us in context, this, this is one of the interesting things about the book of Esther. We ended chapter 1. The king's feast was uh, meant to be a preparatory feast for him to go off to war with Greece. And it makes it seem as if chapter 2 begins right after that party because it says, after these things, when the king had, or the anger of the king had abated, it, it seems like, well, this, you know, maybe is like the next day or a week later. And in fact, it's not. In fact, there's as many as a few years have passed between the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. And in the meantime... The king, Ahasuerus, has gone off to battle, has taken his armies, the armies that he was preparing through the feast. He has gone over to Greece, thinking that we're going to take over the rest of the known world, the part that has eluded me, and in fact, it does not happen that way. In fact, King Ahasuerus suffers incredible defeats, humiliating defeats, and he deplenishes and empties all of the money that he had. Now, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but this was an extremely costly war that he went and fought and lost. And of course, we know that this temperamental king, he could fly off the handle at any minute, so he returns, and upon returning, he, he recalls. And I just picture him riding up the dirt road, turning it into some brick road of, of just fancy diamond-plated lamps along the side, and he's getting closer and closer to his palace, and as he looks up and remembers the sheer greatness and grandness of his palace, he remembers the queen whom he had deposed. And the, uh, the, the outcome of that is, now I'm a king without a queen. And I don't know, maybe he's feeling lonely. Maybe he's feeling depressed because of his significant losses. Maybe he's just thinking, I need a way to put on a good face. Because really, at the end of the day, the kingdom and its power is all simply a facade. It's all about the looks. Does he look powerful? Does he look like he's got things together? Does he look in charge? Can he handle this? 
And the men around him are thinking, we've got to do something before our king flies off the handle and this depression throws him into a fit of rage and he has all of his palace people and all of his, his council, he just has us all wiped out. So what do we do? So his men come up with this great, this great plan. I say that sarcastically. They go to the king and they say, here's an idea. Let's replace Vashti. And what we're going to do is we're going to put people in all the provinces of the land and we're going to seek out a a beautiful young virgin to come in and have tryouts to become your next queen. And it should be a bit of a foretelling or foretelling that the only requirements they had of this young lady is that she be young, that she be beautiful, and that she be a virgin. what What a picture of the king's superficial care. He doesn't say, let's go pick a queen or find a queen who's intelligent, capable, ready, uh, can, can handle being in a leadership role. No, 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 no. None of those things matter. We just need someone who's beautiful and young and a virgin. That's all we need. This is the person we want to find. And there's a danger after this of kind of reading through Esther chapter 2, and they talk about this search that's going to happen, that the king's going to issue this decree to find this young woman. And then maybe we, and then we're told about this, this, this young Jew who lives there in the capital city, and she's an orphan. She's kind of a down-on-her-luck type of person. And you can buy into this idea that this is such a good rags-to-riches story. Almost a fairy tale story. This is, like, this is like a Cinderella story where the king has decided we're going to find a queen, so we're going to have this big, beautiful banquet. We're going to bring in all these lovely young women who we're certainly not going to objectify in any sort of way. And we're going to have them do some kind of a tryout. We're going to see who they are. It's almost like a beauty pageant. And at the end of the beauty pageant, we're going to pick the best one, the loveliest, the the, the nicest, the kindest woman. We're going to give her that glass slipper, and then she's going to become the queen of the land. What a beautiful fairy tale. And that would be a fairy tale. Because that is not what happens in this story. I don't want to be the guy that always says we've got to not be naive. We've got to look at things through a true lens. But in this case, we really do need to make sure we take off our cultural lens of thinking things like rags to riches, you know, Cinderella story type stuff. This is a dark story. It's a difficult one. Part of the picture of weakness of Esther is that she seemingly has no choice. To be fair, the author here doesn't tell us whether or not all the the ladies in this story are forcibly detained and brought to the capital. We might even be able to assume that some of the gals that are gathered in this thing might have thought, okay, well, this is my way out. There's a chance that those ladies existed But I would just put this question to you, young ladies in the room. How would you feel if the president decided he was done with his first lady, and so he sent to all of the states a collection, and if you meet these superficial standards of young, beautiful virgin, you're coming. You're coming with us. Maybe some would go willingly. My thought is, this is not a Cinderella story. This is closer to something that's like human trafficking. We need to understand that. So in order order to see that maybe in a better way, we should look at some of the things that's going to happen to these ladies. Just a few things. First of all, whatever life they had planned to live was out the window. You're a young lady. Maybe you're thinking about someday having a family. Maybe there's even uh, an arrangement for you to be married at this point, and, and that was a normal thing at that point in time. You don't have to think about that in terms of forcible arrangement. But maybe there was a, a young man who you had your eyes on, and he had his eyes on you, and the plan was someday we're going to get married. Not anymore. That's gone. Whatever plans of a nice, quiet, peaceful family life you had planned out for yourselves in the safety of the Persian Empire, this massive, huge land, those were gone. Your plans aren't a problem for the king because he has a plan for you, a different one. 
and it looks like you're coming to the Capitol for my tryout for a new queen. And secondly, this is not a short process. This isn't a show up 48 hours and then you're gone. This is, in all honesty, this is probably a lifelong situation for everybody involved. Why do I say that? Well, it's, it's certainly going to be a lifelong issue for whoever is the queen. Whoever that person is that's fortunate enough to win the queen slot, she's there. She's stuck. There's no turning back at that point. But even the young ladies that are gathered, it's unlikely that the king is going to have a, a wonderful mind to just say like, hey, you, you know, if you didn't get a rose this week, it's okay. You, you head on home. That's a Bachelor reference, by the way. I've never watched The Bachelor. That's not going to happen. In all likelihood, everyone that's gathered is, is done. They're stuck. They're, they're in the king's harem now. They are the king's property. They're his possession. And whether or not he selects a, a particular young lady to be the queen won't matter to him. She may still end up as a concubine, which is effectively the king's property for pleasure purposes. What a horrifying life. Talk about losing contact with family, friends. That's, that's gone. And of course, this is not simply a beauty pageant. This isn't a situation where the king and his men are going to sit. There's going to be a runway, and the beautiful young lady is going to walk down the runway and then walk back, and the king's going to say, well, she's nice, but, you know, like it's seven out of ten. This is not what's happening. What we read is that the young ladies were prepared for this, this was a, a, up to a year-long process of being prepared. They're beautified. They're made to understand royal, you know, gestures and what do you do, what don't you do? Because we, I mean, if you've ever seen anything on, on like on TV with the queens and all that stuff and, and the prince, uh, I think about like in England, they have specific protocol. How do you walk into the room? How do you bow? What do you address the king? Do you do not speak until spoken to kind of stuff. So the, the young ladies are all prepared for this, but then catch this. It's not a, like a beauty pageant. What, what does it say that they do in order to show themselves worthy to the king? They go in the night before and they come out the next morning. Now the disgusting details of whatever happens in that evening are left to our imagination, unfortunately. And I can't imagine that being a pleasant experience for anyone. This king has forced me away from my family, all of my plans for life. He has forced me to his palace. He's forced me to deal with this beautifying process. And then I am forcibly told, it's your turn. You will follow the rules. You will go into the king's room and you will not come out till the morning. And you will do whatever the king tells you to do. Folks, that's a picture of what's happening in Esther chapter 2. That does not sound like a Cinderella story. This is not a love at first sight story. This is a horrifying story of an incredibly powerful royal class and king doing whatever he pleases to whomever he pleases whenever he pleases. And in we meet Esther. In the middle of this nationwide search, we find Esther, our weak orphan, a, a least of these, who's being cared for only by the grace and love of her adopted father, Mordecai, who's actually her cousin. And when his uncle dies and his aunt is gone, he says to himself, I will care for this young lady. This really is a, that, that actually is a kind of a heartwarming moment to see a family continuing to care. He's not going to allow her to just be an orphan and he brings her in. And we meet Esther and, and of course, it, dis, it gives us this description of how she meets the standard Qualifications. She's young. She's beautiful. It talks about uh, she had a beautiful figure. She was lovely to look at. But there's something else about Esther. And this is why I think, it, to me, this makes it just particularly 
gruesome. I don't know a better way to describe it because Esther isn't, it's not just that she's beautiful to look at. If you read and look at the ways that she's described in her interactions with all the people, she, it's, it's repeatedly emphasized that she's winning favor. When she's taken into Haggai, she's placed in his custody. So she's already been, been taken from her home. All, she knows what's coming. She's already been pulled away. She's been kidnapped, for lack of a better way to say it. And she's been placed in the custody of this eunuch, this, this man who's in charge of the women, Haggai. And she finds favor. She pleased him and won his favor. Even further down, we see that Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So she's ripped from her home. She's beautiful. She's lovely. And then she goes in and she's winning the favor of the people who are in charge. And then I'm assuming throughout that entire process, it continues to show true that she's just not, not simply beautiful on the outside. She's a lovely person. She's humble. She's kind. She takes the instructions from her adopted father, Mordecai, and does what he says. And then even by the time she's being presented to the king, which we just discussed what that's going to look like, and certainly she understands all these things, she goes into the king's room and she's winning favor with all of the leaders, but then she wins favor with the king. Now we have to imagine that there was the lust-filled aspect of that because she was beautiful. But I have a hard time assuming that Esther's innocence, her humility, her, her gentle nature, at least what it seems, caused the king to look at her and see something special. Rightfully so. Because everything up to this point suggests that Esther was not simply beautiful on the outside. She was just a lovely gal who won the favor of everyone she came across. Now, I mentioned briefly there the fact that in her humility, she listens to Mordecai. Now, Mordecai gives her a very interesting command. He says, you are not to tell anyone about your identity. You are to keep it secret. And what that's saying, and it's mentioned a couple times, repetitive things are important. What he's saying is don't let anyone know you're Jewish. Don't tell anybody. Now this command, this specific command has been questioned over and over and over because there's, we want to know why is Mordecai so dead set that no one knows she's Jewish? Why does he want her to hide her identity? And we might even ask several questions that, that point us towards the judgment of Mordecai, maybe even Esther. We might say like, well, wait a minute. They give us this picture of Vashti in chapter one who refused the king. So why wouldn't Esther re simply refuse the king? Why wouldn't Mordecai protect her, even if that's futile? Why wouldn't he refuse to let her be taken? Why wouldn't he just give his life to honor her and to, to care for her? Why wouldn't he do these things? In fact, even after she's removed, why would he then give her this instruction, which just seems a bit counterintuitive? Don't let them know you're a Jew. Why is that counterintuitive to us? Because I think what we do is we expect faithfulness. And, and is that a faithful way to live, to refuse to acknowledge our faith and our ethnicity? So we, we come up with this problem of judging these two. And we might say something like, should I judge Esther and Mordecai for their seemingly lack of faithfulness in their behavior and the way that they treat this situation? And, and I don't think we should do that. <coughs> First of all, the author doesn't make any mention of it. Matter of fact, the author doesn't make any mention of the difficulties that anyone has. He leaves us in the tension. He leaves us in this place where we're wondering how does a good person deal with this? Would I deal with it the same way? <coughs> Would I be able to keep the faith in this situation? Would I be able to serve under this king uh, honorably and, and be content with having to keep my faith quiet? And what this is doing, what this is forcing us to consider even today is how we as Christians live in the tension of being in an empire, a seemingly pagan empire, a seemingly secular empire, 
and being faithful people. And, and part of the challenge comes from Paul. Paul tells us that, that we are not citizens of this world, but we're citizens of heaven. And then he reinforces it further by telling us, let not your manner of life, or let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. In other words, live like a Christian. And I don't think there's any doubt here. We talk about this regularly. We have to live out our faith. We have to pick up our cross, and we have to, we have to bear the burden of that. And we're to walk uh, honoring God and pointing to God. We don't deny him. And, and it, this instruction seems just consistent throughout the New Testament. We don't deny Christ, and, and it would be expected of us that if we were in a similar situation, I would say, I refuse to bow the knee to this false God or this false king because I only bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And then we look at that, we take that knowledge and information in, and we apply it to Esther, and there's confusion because this doesn't make any sense that now Esther is flat out ignoring and hiding her Jewishness. Furthermore, Esther's hardly a moral example for us to follow, which is the danger that we get into when we take the actions of someone and we try to apply it directly to how we should behave. In other words, Esther is giving us a description, not a prescription. We're to see that the, the story is being told as it actually happened. The author of Esther isn't, isn't blocking out the details of the difficulty of living as a Jew in a pagan society. He's saying, no, this was a really difficult thing. They may or may not have made good decisions. We certainly wouldn't prop Esther up and just say, well, use Esther as a guide for your young ladies. Think about what Esther had to do. She had to allow herself to be taken, and then she had to uh, be humble and kind, and then she ended up as the queen. That's not the kind of instruction we would give young ladies now, is it? Be smart and beautiful and young and, and meet a rich young guy and, and maybe someday you'll be well cared for. That's not the kind of moral example we set and yet that seems like what Esther does even if it's against her will. The danger is just moralizing everything they do and saying, well, I guess be like Esther or you know what, don't be like Esther, be like Vashti. That's not the book of Esther's point, right? We fall into serious traps of just simply moralizing the behavior of characters in the Old Testament. Think of, we do this all the time with stories about David. David, you know, he took the stones and he killed Goliath. Be like David, except not like David a few chapters later where he, you know, murders and commits adultery. Don't be, <laughs> folks, the, the story of scripture is meant to point us to Christ. We want to be Christ-like. We don't have a call to be Esther-like or even Mordecai-like. We're getting, we're getting a, a real picture, a real world picture that we can relate to because in our culture, how often will your Christian faith be pressed against in such a way that you have to decide when you're gonna stand up and when you're not? With your, not, with your friends who are not believers, you have to decide, is every conversation going to turn into a fist fight about trusting in Christ, or am I going to have to lead them with some gentleness and kindness and maturity and love and care? And sometimes that's going to look like I'm not going to tell them everything I believe all at once all the time. Sometimes I'm going to lead them gently. Sometimes aspects of what I believe are going to remain under the surface for a time and I will seek God in prayer and seek his wisdom and seek him through his word to understand when is the right time to stand up and say, no, I refuse. Every hill is not a hill to die on. And I think what we get a picture of here in Esther is, is, is almost as, as the Lord describes being, being wise as serpent and innocent as doves. We have to think when, where, why, how, seek the Lord. How can I know when I need to quit my job because I refuse to work for an organization that's going to uh, be a proponent of these things that are completely anti-Christian? When am I going to refuse to shop at a store that, that supports things that, that are completely contradictory to my Christian faith? Well, how am I going to live in this world if I can't go? Because we run out of things very, very quickly. I can tell you, we probably all shop and pay money to places on a weekly basis that don't hold Christian values. I think you would include places like Target. If you've ever watched a Disney movie, 
This is, this is not apples to apples, obviously, but we can see the tension of being a Christian, being in a society where we're slowly but surely finding our way to the outskirts and our weakness is being taken advantage of more and more and more. We're being pressed aside. Our beliefs, our, our, our desires, our, our, our ability to walk in Christian faith is constantly being pressurized down and down and down and it becomes very difficult to know am I making right decisions or wrong decisions. And in these situations, we're simply left praying, looking to God, looking to his word, and trusting that when he says that he can work all things for the good of his people, for those who love him, he can work all things for our good. We're just trusting that not only is that true, not only is God's providential plan and sovereignty truly capable of taking every decision and every evil thing that happens to us and making it work for our good, but it also, and this is important, hear me, it also accounts for our stupidity our own bad decisions, our own inability to know what the right move is at every given moment. I don't know, God, should I stop shopping at Target? There's not, that's not in the Bible. Wouldn't it be hilarious if it was? Bromans chapter 19, shopping centers. If you're looking for Bromans, that's not actually a chapter in the Bible. That's bro talk. And here's the good news though. If we really do trust in the sovereign providence of God, then we know that not only has he accounted for our failures, for our weaknesses, for our missteps, which then gives us great comfort because we know when he accounts for it that we may pray and we may plan our way. We may plan out what we're going to do, but he directs our steps. And what's more, and I think even more encouraging, he tells us that his power is made perfect in our weaknesses. This is that great uh, nighttime song we sing to our kids. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You know it? Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. So even in our weaknesses, in our in our ineffectiveness, in our inabilities, in our tension of living and making wrong decisions and looking in hindsight and wondering how is God ever gonna use me for anything? I can't seem to get through a day without making a wrong choice. We can turn to him, we can look to him in all of our weaknesses and trust that he is a God who works all things for our good. And this helps us. This helps us when we apply that knowledge to Esther. Because we can, we can understand that regardless of their motives, regardless of their fidelity to God's law, regardless of the decisions that they make, all of these things are working together in, in, some, in some kind of inscrutable way to move God's plan forward. It means that if God has a plan, and he does, my decisions aren't gonna throw it so out of balance that it now is impossible. I'm sure this is what the disciples were thinking as they witnessed Jesus being, or, or refused to witness Jesus being crucified. They're thinking, how on earth does this meet God's plan? How, is this, how could this possibly be the right thing at the right time? And in fact, it was the absolute perfect thing in the perfect moment that was relatively obscure to us, even though Christ had talked about it over and over and over. And he had told that this would happen. We can trust. We can trust with all faith and all heart that God's way is the right way and that he will lead. And we're given a little picture of this even at the end of the story. As Mordecai uncovers this plot to kill the king, he, hear, he overhears just because of his position. Now, now take note that he was, he, was, he was concerned for Esther, so he was near the palace. And because he was near the palace, he overheard these men talking about about being angry with the king, they're going to make a plan for assassination. He uncovers it. This is, a, this is an incredible thing. Because Mordecai here uncovers the plan to kill the king who's taking advantage of his adopted daughter. And rather than just let this happen, he lives in the tension of, no, I'm, I'm going I'm to do the right thing here. And, and this is the right thing, and it's difficult. But he turns them in, saves the king. It's noted in the Chronicles. And then chapter three begins and we have no note of anything good happening for Mordecai at that point. But, and this is where we'll leave it today. This is not the end of the story. 
The story here in chapter two ends with this thought or this idea of he's, you know, his, his adopted daughter has been taken away. She's dealing with this horrific, traumatic, uh, harrowing event. And here I am outside the gates just hoping that she's alive, that she's okay. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do everything I can to protect her. And I, oh, I hear this thing about the king and I'm going to protect the king by doing this. And then, and then it doesn't do anything. And he's certainly left wondering, why, God, would you give me this opportunity to save the king but then not give me anything? You didn't, you didn't save us from this problem. You didn't elevate me in any way. And here's the difficulty of, of, of our lives, and, and we'll finish with this illustration. As I was talking to someone last week, we were talking about how we see the providence of God. Now, you know, you can't see the providence of God in the future. It's impossible. We can't see that. We are not prophets. We're not apostles. We can't foretell or foresee what's coming and how God is going to work things. We're often left working in the dark. And there's actually a, a Jewish illustration that I heard. If you've ever uh, have a chance to follow a guy named Chad Bird, he discusses this in one of his books. And he talks about how the Jewish people looked at their walk in life not as if we're walking forward into the future, which is kind of how we always look. You, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You look in the rearview mirror and you can see it clearly. Well, that's not actually an accurate description because we can't see future very well. We can see maybe a couple steps. The scriptures tell us that the word is a lamp to our feet. It will guide our path, but a lamp only lights up so much. However, the Jewish people would think of this in opposite terms. They would say, we actually walk backwards like this into the future looking at the past because we can see the past clearly. I can't see how God is going to providentially and sovereignly care for me tomorrow, but I can go back and I can see all the ways through the scriptures and even our own lives the ways in which God has aligned things that we never thought possible, the way that he has moved in our lives, the way that he has moved in the past to care for us, to provide for us, to get us to where we are now. We are often negligent of the past because we're trying to walk forward and look and hope and try to figure out what's coming next when what we need to do more often, if we want to trust and see in the power and providence and sovereignty of the Lord is to walk backwards into the future, looking at the past, seeing all the ways in which he has worked and all the ways in which his hand has carried us from where we were to where we are. Let's, let's make a practice of that. That is what I hope you can go away with. Looking in the past and seeing all the ways which God has always been faithful. He's always been kind, always been loving, correcting, disciplined you in ways that moved you to where you are. We can trust him. We can trust him with all of our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us these stories and teaching us of the past, encouraging us with the hope of the future, of the promises that you've made, helping us to know through the ways that you've worked in our lives that you'll continue to work, that you are in fact always at work, that you never stop working for us, that you always love us tenderly and kindly and that you account for our errors and mistakes and because of that we can trust that in every day we can pray for forgiveness we can pray for mercy and it is overflowing and abundant coming from you we lift this to you and we trust you and we trust in your son and it's in his name we pray amen <laughs>